Uh, good morning, everyone. It's been a great conference so far. Um, perhaps uh, you know me from my open source work. Uh, I've worked on a, a number of different projects. Perhaps you've used some of them. Um, I've also done consulting with, with Tilda, and I've recognized a number of our clients here, which is wonderful to see. But um, my, uh, the beginning of my career actually uh, was completely different. I studied uh, naval architecture and marine engineering, and the very first uh, job I had was developing software for safely loading uh, cargo onto ships and also salvaging uh, ships that had become damaged uh, so that, say, holds could be flooded so that the ship could be righted without it breaking into and sinking. <laughs> uh, and as you can imagine, uh, fault tolerance is uh, a very uh, important concern in naval architecture. <laughs> Ships undergo extreme stress. <clears throat> it can be a brutal environment on the sea. And, <laughs> and of course, uh, Ships must be uh, tolerant of operator faults. This, uh, this is literally a picture of me at the helm of an Exxon oil tanker. But don't worry, uh, I don't think the engine was on. So in order to engineer fault tolerance in ships, uh, three-dimensional models are made uh, before ships are constructed. Uh, they undergo finite element analysis. Stresses are uh, placed on these models based upon predictions for, say, 100-year events, 100-year uh, storms, you know, the worst possible conditions that uh, a ship might encounter. And every aspect of a ship is engineered for fault tolerance. Uh, this is a schematic of an engine room. You can see there's, uh, there's a lot of redundancy. These are uh, duplicate fuel oil purifiers. Uh, you might be surprised to learn that ships even carry a spare tail shaft in case the primary one is sheared and it needs to be replaced at sea. And to engineer around uh, possible operator faults, uh, controls have to be laid out as clearly as possible. Obviously, they require a lot of training to use, but, uh, but uh, uh, captains need to, and pilots need to know exactly what, what controls do what, and the state of the ship, all the systems on the ship have to be conveyed to that uh, central uh, control room on the deck. Because uh, ships are so big and valuable, they also, also need to be uh, classified by uh, regulatory bodies, and every aspect of a uh, ship's construction and design is analyzed before it can be flagged and insured. I left, uh, left this world behind uh, when uh, I had to move back east. And I, in the late 90s, I was probably the only one leaving San Francisco to start a career in web development. So the 90s were pretty fun on the web. <laughs> but maybe not so serious. <laughs> and engineering practices left a little bit to be desired. <laughs> but we were pretty accepting because there was more good than bad. And frankly, what we were shipping to browsers uh, wasn't that complicated. It was markup with sprinkles of, of JavaScript to enhance the experience a little bit. The serious engineering uh, and fault tolerance was expected on the server side. Uh, and with, the, with web servers, database servers, of course, the uh, security and reliability of data was still important. So let's fast forward to today, where we have a much different environment. 
much more rigorous uh, engineering practices across the full stack um, and wonderful new front end technologies like uh, Ember.js, which really flip uh, the model from uh, sprinklings of, of JavaScript to almost uh, uh, a JavaScript core with uh, sprinklings of markup. What we're building with Ember.js are uh, complex, sophisticated, independent systems that we're launching into our uh, users' browsers. And uh, after the Glimmer demo, I had to update the slide to represent Ember better. <laughs> so our Ember apps let our users zip around at their whim within our, do our application's domain, um, getting getting uh, to, to uh, the places they need to go as quickly as possible uh, with uh, as little interference as possible. But make no mistake, these are, uh, these are complicated systems and fault tolerance needs to be a primary concern for us. And the environment in which we launch these applications is, uh, can also be uh, severe and stressful. We have uh, multiple devices to support, multiple browsers, uh, sometimes uh, browsers with JavaScript disabled, sometimes with internet disabled, sometimes with the browser itself disabled. <laughs> and we have uh, users with little to no training and perhaps overly optimistic too. So when I think about fault tolerance, I like to think about the user experience we want to provide to those users so that they're, uh, they're shielded from any environmental uh, uh, stresses that our application uh, encounters. And when I think about the, uh, the primary concern of providing a fault tolerant user experience, I like to think of it as a transactional user experience. Much like uh, a database uh, has, uh, has to operate transac transactionally in order to be reliable. It needs to have these characteristics in order to uh, reliably uh, commit data. Transactions must be uh, atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. This is the so-called ACID test for uh, a transactions reliability. Atomic means that uh, transactions must be all or nothing. If you're editing a uh, if you're editing data on a form that's complicated, that represents multiple models, all of that data needs to be either saved together or discarded. Uh, you shouldn't, uh, in this case, uh, save the contact without saving uh, the changes to the phone number. Even if, under the hood, you're representing these, uh, these two uh, aspects of a contact with different modeling. A transaction should be consistent. It should move between valid states. This is a particular challenge uh, for server rendered apps that push uh, partial uh, fragments of, uh, of markup to a page. And uh, it's pretty easy for those partials to, get, uh, in, to become inconsistent. This is not a problem for uh, frameworks such as uh, Ember, in which there's a canonical uh, uh, data model that's driving the bindings in, the, in, our, in our templates. Transactions should be isolated as well. That means they should allow concurrent changes. Um, changes, uh, say if you're editing uh, editing that contact and you're providing a uh, submit and a cancel button, you're providing a contract with the user of your application say, to say uh, that you, you're, you're editing this contact in, in its own context. 
Uh, this context should be isolated from the rest of the application and should only be submitted back to it when you press submit or just discarded when you press cancel. Uh, this can be a little tricky to do, and it's why a lot of editing forms uh, on, in modern web apps have simply a, a, a done uh, button, say, where you're, you're not providing that same contract of isolation of the, of the edits, and your edits are uh, automatically flowing through to the canonical models in your application. So uh, transactions should also, of course, be durable. Uh, users need to be confident that they're going to persist. When you push that submit button uh, and you, uh, you expect that change to be saved now and forever, you, and you expect when you reload your browser that uh, that change will still be persisted. So these are pretty, uh, pretty hard and fast uh, rules for uh, <clears throat> for a, a, a fault-tolerant user experience. These are rules you should, should not violate, or you're really violating the, your user's trust. Users have a very fixed, hard mental model about a, tran a transactional user experience, and if you cross that model, then they'll feel that something is just not right with your application. There's another aspect of fault-tolerant user experience, and that is kinder and gentler. It's a forgiving user experience. Applications uh, should try to provide a forgiving user experience for the love of kittens. This is gonna make people happy. One aspect of a forgiving user experience is uh, to provide transitional persistence, perhaps to, pers to per meaning to persist um, data that has not yet been saved but is in the process of being edited. Uh, you might have experienced this on GitHub when you're, uh, say, editing uh, or commenting on a pull request and You've edit, entered a comment, you flip over the files changed, the other tab, you think, oh no, I might have lost that comment, I typed all that out, but you come back and you're delighted that that comment is still there. That's, uh, that's great. Um, and let's see. Another aspect of a forgiving user experience is undo and redo. If you make a mistake, like say deleting a few emails that you don't want to, you didn't mean to delete, Gmail is nice enough to provide an undo. Another nice feature that can delight your users is to provide offline support. There are certain types of applications which can really benefit from offline support. Uh, in particular, uh, applications which are editing, uh, where you're editing data uh, pretty much in isolation, where uh, your data doesn't need to be uh, tied to a response from, uh, from the server, and there's no reason to block your user from continuing to work with that data when, when your internet connection goes down. It's a, an engineering challenge, but, but if you can solve it, it's a real win for usability. On a related note, a similar feature is to provide an asynchronous interface that's, that's not blocked by the request response cycle with the server, where your user can make changes as quickly as possible, and regardless of the, the state of your server, they can, uh, those changes can be queued up and synced at uh, your app's convenience. 
So I've been talking about the user experience that we desire, the fault-tolerant user experience. And I'm sure that as developers, you're looking at, at, this, at these different uh, degrees of, um, of, of complexity in the user experience that I'm covering and, and immediately thinking about engineering those user experiences. Well, Ember is terrific at providing a consistent user experience across your app. As I've shown your, uh, in the case of, say, you know, bindings between models and templates, everything is, is mapped to a canonical data, and it is, uh, it's a no-brainer to keep your app consistent. Similarly, uh, Ember Data also pro provides that canonical data store and provides for consistency um, in your, your data models and also uh, uh, through its uh, ability to communicate through adapters with uh, servers of many different kinds, it provides durability. Ember data does require a, a bit of work uh, to uh, provide atomicity and an isolated user experience. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it, takes, it takes extra code, a bit of customization to say fork data, provide editing in a separate context and persist that data back. Similarly, uh, a lot of the, the aspects of a forgiving user experience require extra work. I was thinking about these challenges uh, over a year and a half ago at a time when Ember Data was, was uh, less stable and was, um, had, had some, uh, uh, had some engineering challenges, which I'm, I'm glad to report, many of which have, have uh, been solved. Um, but when I was thinking about these problems, I thought about the basic assumptions of data storage and the client and the primitives that we use to model that data storage and synchronization with, uh, with remote sources. And so I started with the basics and with uh, thinking about sources as equal but disparate, containing complex but different shapes of data. And obviously, in order to get these disparate sources to communicate with each other. They'll need common interfaces. And across for those common interfaces to work well together, they'll need to normalize data. Data will need to be moved uh, between the interfaces in, in a normalized fashion that they, all the, uh, uh, the sources agree upon. And because I'm looking at, at modeling uh, a lot of different types of data. I should be a little more specific here. I'm talking about perhaps an app that uses uh, web sockets, might commit to REST, but would also like to provide an offline experience with index DB and, um, and, and have uh, a memory source in wh which, which contains the canonical data that's presented to the user. So I'm, I'm trying to model all of these uh, complex sources in a single, single application. And in order to tie them together, there's no, there's no fixed pattern that for exactly how you're, you're going to tie different sources of different types together. So you need to allow for ad hoc connections between them. And the, the ad hoc pattern that appealed to me most was, uh, was the event subscriber pattern. Now, of course, with sources that might be local or might be remote, uh, as, 
as, as Ember Data has learned, um, the, everything has to be promisified uh, if, if there's a chance that it might be asynchronous. And so if these evented connections could be promise aware, then they could communicate this normalized data across common interfaces. And it's with these primitives that I developed Orbit.js, which is not Ember specific, but it's a standalone JavaScript library for coordinating access to data sources and keeping their content synchronized. Orbit has a couple uh, primary interfaces. One is requestable and one is transformable. Any source can, uh, can implement one or both of these. The requestable interface is developer friendly. It provides uh, find methods and CRUD methods as well. The transformable method, the transformable interface provides a single method transform which uh, takes an operation. And that operation is JSON patch data. That's the form of normalized data that I arrived at. JSON patch um, provides an operation, a path, and a value. Uh, so there are, there are operations like add, remove, replace, delete. And these op JSON patch was developed to operate against a JSON document. So internal to each source, uh, you have a JSON document, and these patches can be applied, and the patches, uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about, about having normalized data and an agreed upon schema is that the patches uh, will, can also return their inverses, which can then be applied to undo a change. So in order to connect the requestable interfaces, with each other, or the transformable interfaces with each other. Uh, there are different connectors, and these connectors, as I've discussed, are event-driven. Are event and the, the events, um, say, if you were to take a look at a synchronous, synchronous event handling, it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward because opera, uh, operations happen um, serially. But it gets more interesting when you get into asynchronous operations, which we could be talking about with remote sources, uh, say a REST source or, um, or, or uh, a socket. Uh, so, so these events um, are promise aware, and so the, the connectors basically translate the events uh, to between sources and sources that want to engage with those events can return a promise, and the event, the originating event, won't be resolved until all the promises uh, that, are, uh, that are involved in that, uh, in that transaction are resolved. So there are, that's the async blocking pattern in which um, in which sources say, yes, I want to be involved in the resolution of an event. In the async non-blocking pattern, um, then sources might take a while to resolve, but they, they're saying, I don't want to hold up the other sources, so they don't return a promise, but they, they receive the event and they go on and perform their action. So it's with, with these primitives, with the, that the transform and requestable connectors can wire together multiple sources of disparate types and the normalized data can flow between them and the promises keep everything in sync whether it's asynchronous or not. So that's great from a theoretical perspective but let's, it's not useful without a common library of sources. And so far Orbit has has uh, a few uh, standard ones, a memory source, local storage source, and a JSON API source, which is uh, currently in transition, gonna, as, as JSON API nears uh, 1.0, uh, which is hopefully gonna be tomorrow. And <laughs> so you, you, you can believe that this, uh, this source will be one of the first implementations that's completely compliant. Um, and in order to normalize the data 
between these sources, they need to agree on a schema. So models, relationships, and keys. Uh, now, since I'm at EmberCon, um, I, I, when I talk about Orbit and Ember, I need to talk about Ember Orbit, which is a separate library that should feel familiar to you if you're an Ember data user. It has a store that encapsulates an, uh, uh, an Orbit source. And that provides uh, both synchronous and asynchronous methods. The synchronous methods provide direct access to what's in the, in the source uh, with all filter retrieve methods. Asynchronous methods to uh, access the requestable interfaces asynchronously. And you can, behind the scenes, you can connect multiple orbit sources and connectors, um, and all the data will flow through and back to the store. The model is uh, a representation of a particular record in the in the store, and it can be. And the definition of the model informs the schema that's used across orbit. Just as in Ember, URLs drive application state. The underlying orbit sources uh, drive the model state in uh, in Ember Orbit. So, um, if uh, if a socket uh, if a socket connector is if a socket source is connected to your um, canonical uh, Ember Orbit store, then the the changes that are applied in Orbit will flow through to your models and your models will automatically reflect those changes. Uh, so what are the application patterns that you can use with Orbit and Ember Orbit specifically? Well, you can, you can uh, start by developing your applications with uh, client, client first uh, with no concern for other connectors. You can just work with an, with an Ember Orbit store. Uh, as your application develops, you can add Pluggable sources, uh, you could connect, say, uh, a local storage source and an index DB source to provide different uh, capacities for local, uh, for browser-based storage. You could synchronize uh, data between uh, between sockets, a socket source and a REST source, in, and they, you could set up different connectors with uh, bidirectional or unidirectional between them. And you can provide editing isolation by just simply forking a store, uh, providing, edi providing edits of any complexity, like a form that drives a that's driven by a wizard that has multiple pages, and those edits are uh, done in complete isolation and either applied or, discard or discarded, um, and then that flows back to the uh, canonical store. And last but not least, be because all of the changes are uh, deterministic JSON patch changes and every source returns its inverse when its changes are applied to it. Those changes can be tracked uh, deterministically and they can be uh, undone uh, in multiple levels or redone. If you're interested in Orbit, um, it's getting pretty close to, uh, to a, a stability. I've been working really hard the last few weeks uh, I'd hope to get orbitjs.com up. It's going to be uh, the JSON API work has uh, delayed a few things, but I'm I'm looking to get that up in the next uh, in the next month or so, and uh, I feel like it's it's getting uh, close to the point where I want to put together the the docs and guides to to make it a lot more uh, developer friendly. So uh, if you're interested in following the Orbit story, um, please. Uh, uh, Check out Orbit.js on Twitter or IRC, and uh, even if uh, even if you're not particularly interested in Orbit, please keep in mind fault tolerance for all of your Ember applications. Thank you very much. <laughs>